Lady of the Hex House. Rapture is a handy tool for those who use it properly. Any covenant or practitioner of the art worth their weight in salt knows this. Misleading those with what they want to hear can easily lead to fortuitous seduction. 1. Offer advice containing a hook. 2. Pick appropriate times for consultation, preferably after the mark has suffered a particularly long day. 3. Mirror that which they are. Become a part of not just the events of their life, but their life. These three rules will provide the opportunity to command those with feeble will and lacking constitution. Captain John Byers placed a paper on his desk and rubbed his eyes. Across from him sat Larry Green, a third-grade detective responsible for the arrest. What is this? said Byers. I found it in Mrs. Smith's room, along with some other items. Isn't she the one who was picked up for fraud? Yes, sir, said Green. We found a storeroom filled with ration books. The complaint had been provided by a local kid working in the market Mrs. Smith frequented. The war was now in its third year, and the government was offering food rations for those less fortunate, with each member of their household receiving one. According to the kid, Mrs. Smith had brought in a binder. Maybe the kid felt like it was his patriotic duty to turn her in, but Evans suspected it might be a little more personal. Byers looked down at the paper and said, What else did you find? A bunch of books and two women locked in her basement. Byers looked up at the man, hoping for any indication of a joke. Are you serious? Yes, sir, I am. Do we know who they are? Virginia Evans and Willetta Horner. Are they kids? Both are in their early 30s, said Green. And no one reported them missing? Apparently not, but I did get in touch with Miss Evans' father. All he said was, I knew it, and then he hung up. I want a background check done on Mrs. Smith, and I want to talk to those girls, said Byers. I have them in the waiting room. Where's Mrs. Smith now? She's in questioning. Do you want to see her? Let me talk to the women first, said Byers, rising from his chair. He followed Green out of the office. Together, they made their way down the paint-depleted hall, pausing at a window on the right. It was a one-way pane of glass four feet wide and three feet tall, designed for clandestine observation. It revealed a small room with a metal table placed at the center. A woman in her late 40s or early 50s wearing a black velvet dress with a wide Peter Pan collar sat with her hands folded on her lap. She was staring straight ahead, as if in a trance, her face stoic. Mrs. Smith, said Byers. That's her, said Green. She doesn't seem too concerned, said Byers. Let's get to the women. They sat on a couch, their hands intertwined, and unlike Mrs. Smith, their faces were contemporary works of fear and confusion. Another difference was what they were wearing. Their bodies were decorated in dirty hand-me-down dresses. The woman on the right was sporting a fading bruise on her cheek. Byers entered the room, pausing briefly, and proceeded to sit across from them. Ladies, he began, my name is Captain John Byers, and I'm here to help you. We just want to go home, said the one on the left, the one without the bruise. I understand that, said Byers, and you will, but first I need to ask you some questions. We didn't do anything. I didn't say you did, said Byers. Listen, can I get you anything? Coffee? Tea? We want to go home, said the woman on the right, with a voice barely above a whisper. I promise you will. Which one of you is Virginia Evans? The woman with a bruise slowly nodded her head. Then that would make you Willetta Horner? My friends at work call me Willa, the girl said, struggling to smile. You work? said Byers. Yes, sir, said Willa. Six days a week. Where do you work? Murphy's Metal Manufacturing. Right, said Byers, leaning back in his chair. They have a contract for tank treads. Yes, sir, said Willa. We make those and a lot of other stuff. Murphy's Metal Manufacturing was one of the lucky ones who had managed to survive the crash and had landed a lucrative government contract in support of the war. What about you, Virginia? said Byers, glancing at the girl with the bruised face. She has a job at the country diner, said Willa. Does she talk? said Byers. I do, sir, said Virginia. I'm a waitress. Byers reached into the inside of his jacket and removed a small pad of paper, flipping it open. He then pulled out a pen from the breast pocket of his shirt. How did you get that mark on your face? Virginia lowered her chin, her hand rising to where the purplish patch had begun to yellow. I was late, she murmured. What was that? Virginia let her hand fall to her lap and said, 
It was my fault. I was talking to Hank Miller after work. He's the cook, and I forgot to check the time. Are you saying you were punished for being late, said Byers? I'm never late, said Willa, with a tone of pride that baffled Byers. What were you late to, said Byers. Check in, said Virginia, and it was payday. She really doesn't like it if we're late on payday. Who doesn't like it, said Byers, but he was pretty sure that he knew. Mother, said Virginia. Is Mrs. Smith your mother? She is the shepherd, and we must follow her law. Byers leaned forward. These women, with their glassy, faraway eyes, were as lost as lost could be. They wanted nothing more than to go home. And to them, home was back where they had been found, locked inside of a basement. Weren't you being held captive, he said. We were being punished, said Willa. For what? Before either of the women could answer, there was a knock on the door. Green peeked his head in and said, Can I see you for a moment, Captain? Excuse me, ladies, said Byers, rising from the chair. I'll be back. The two women watched him leave in silence, their hands clenched together like a lifeline. What do you think, said Green, once they were out in the hall. I don't know what to think, said Byers. It's like they're brainwashed or something. They just might be, said Green. Let me show you something. Byers followed the man to where a wide doorway stood open, leading into a large conference room. The corporate table spanned across the floor with a row of leather chairs lining each side. On the table were a stack of books, a pad of weathered paper, and a manila folder. Take a look at these, said Green, planting himself in a chair. Byers sat across from Green, grabbing one of the books. It was titled Magical Words of Submission. He dropped it to the table and reached for another titled Power Over Others. Then there was witchcraft of the past and summoning the devil. A low wattage chill began to creep through his spine. These were in her house, he said. By her bed, said Green, along with a bunch of notes. You looked at one earlier. So there was no kidnapping, said Byers. It doesn't look like it. What else do you have, said Byers. Green slid the manila folder over to Byers. This is what I wanted to show you, he said. It's the background check on Mrs. Smith. It read like a Greek tragedy, a promising life that was soon chipped away by disasters, events that not only crippled the mind, but devastated the soul. It was enough to dilute anyone's faith. Mrs. Caroline Smith's fall from grace began in 1915 with the death of her first baby boy. He had died two days after being born, allowing just enough time for her love to blossom into pointless hope. But sorrow wasn't finished with her yet. Indeed, it had only just begun. In 1919, another child was born. Only this time, there would be no period of hope. Its life had ended in her eighth month of pregnancy. It was after the death of the second infant that her doctor recommended that she not try again, leaving her devastated. It had been the one thing that she had always wanted, and it, like the children, had been taken away from her. Time continued on, as it always does, allowing the wounds to heal, but there would always be scars. Her one anchor through it all was her husband, Faye. She had married Faye Smith in 1914. He was a salesman of extraordinary talent, and because of that, they were able to live a life of luxurious means shared by few others. But sorrow never relents for some, and Black Friday came as a ferocious reminder. Faye, like so many others, lost his job, and for him it would be his final loss. His body was found near his car on an old road with a gun lying next to him. It was the final push over the proverbial edge for Mrs. Smith. The world was now a black space filled with anguish, a desolate place where joy was nothing more than a setup. And yet, financially, things did seem to improve for Mrs. Smith. Her husband did have a life insurance policy, and although it wasn't a lot, it was enough to get her by. Byers sat back, sliding the report towards the center of the table. It's sad, he said. But that's not all, said Green. Her husband had recently become an insurance salesman. So that was his own policy she received? Yes, said Green, and there was a maid. They had a maid during the Depression? Yes, sir, said Green. Mr. Smith wanted to let her go, but Mrs. Smith begged him to keep her on after talking her into getting a policy. Are you saying that the maid signed a life insurance policy? Yes, sir, and Mrs. Smith was the lone beneficiary. And where is this maid now? Dead, said Green. She walked out into traffic three months after Mr. Smith died. Byers let his eyes drift over to the book titled Power Over Others and stifled a shudder. 
Is something like this even possible, he said, more to himself. Until now, I would have said no, said Green. But quite frankly, those two women scare the shit out of me. Yes, Bayer agreed. They were scary, and not just because they seemed content to be slaves, but because they actually wanted to be. Even the most brutal crimes, like murder and assault, were usually easy to label. Most were driven by either passion or greed. For Byers, this did seem to have some element of greed attached, but he doubted if it was the only motive. It's time to talk to Mrs. Smith, he said, rising from his chair. Mrs. Smith could have been a statue. Byers entered the room to find her still staring straight ahead, her back rigid. He took the seat across from her and offered a smile. It was then that Mrs. Smith's eyes locked onto his. They were dark blue, almost the color of an early morning sky. Her skin held the pallid tint of porcelain, corpse-like. Byers had always taken pride in his ability to read people, to notice fleeting expressions. But with her, there was no tell. Her appearance remained portrait still. Hello, Mrs. Smith. I'm Captain Byers. She said nothing. You do know why you're here, right? A change suddenly morphed over her face. Her lips curled up at the corners, and her eyes brightened. Byers would later swear that her skin seemed to, for lack of a better term, come alive. I have made a mistake, she said in a voice filled with enough honey to kill a bear. I will be happy to pay back everything that I spent. That's all very well, Mrs. Smith. But what about the two women found in your basement? Will and Virginia? They're my roommates. According to them, you're more like their boss. Oh, they're just a couple of silly girls. They'd be lost without me. Is that why they call you mother? They do that out of love, she said, her eerie smile widening. And is it that love that allows you to lock them in the basement? It's what they want, she said. They know they can be bad sometimes, and they expect me to notice. Why do you take their money? Because they want me to, said Mrs. Smith. It's part of the agreement. The agreement? Yes, she said, leaning forward. And for a moment, Byers thought he saw something flicker deep within her violet eyes, like a flashing bulb that failed to light. You see, Captain Byers, this world is a cold place. It's even worse if you're a woman, especially if you're a woman over 30 and single. I don't understand, said Byers. We are outcasts, Captain. Unwanted and thrown away. Society has deemed us unfit, and so we must wander this earth like ghosts, shunned and avoided. I read your file, Mrs. Smith. I know about your children and what happened to your husband. The flare was again in her eyes. Then you know what I'm telling you is true, she said. This world is a cold place. Is that why you practice witchcraft? She let out a laugh that caused Byers to scoot back. Is that what you're charging me with, Captain? Witchcraft? Of course not, he said. I'm just curious. Then get your own books, she said. Mrs. Smith, what happened to your maid, Captain Byers? We both know that the only thing you have on me are a few fraudulent food vouchers, and I've already offered to pay them back. And it's a federal offense, said Byers. But you're not a federal officer, now are you, Captain? I am not, said Byers. Then I have nothing more to say to you. With that, Mrs. Smith constricted back into her statuesque pose, her face once again becoming a porcelain dish. Byers watched this with silent fascination. As far as this woman, being a witch, was concerned, he still struggled to believe. But something was there. Something buried deep beyond the facade of erroneous manners that she projected. Was she evil? Maybe. But Byers was sure that she hadn't started out that way. Mrs. Smith's malevolence was a product created by a stack of calamities that few could ever overcome. And when one's light begins to fade, you can either fade with it or learn to accept the darkness. Mrs. Smith not only accepted this darkness, but had learned to thrive within its shadows. And that made her dangerous. Byers left the room, promising to keep a very close eye on her case. It was a promise that he kept. Virginia and Willa were returned to whatever small towns they had come from, and Byers hoped that whatever spell they had been under could be erased. Mrs. Smith pleaded guilty to defrauding the government and was sentenced to one year in prison, but that was all. Any other allegations were quickly shelved away as unprovable rumors. She was released on a cold day in November and luck, or something else, was still with her. The war had been over for six months and was still receiving the top spot in the news, overshadowing the tiny column reserved for her. But Byers noticed. 
He sat in his roadmaster and watched as she left the iron gate of McAllister State Penitentiary and entered a cab. But it was the last time he or anyone else would see her. She, like the light that had been stripped from her so many years ago, vanished and was never seen again.